so we'll get through that uh, or get to that in a second. Uh, I'll give a brief introduction uh, of Spectrodyne and our technology, how it works, so we're all on the same page, um, and uh, then hand it over to the people you're really here to see, who are uh, Dr. Johan Kim from Mayo Clinic, uh, who will present comparative analysis of fluorescent particle size and concentration using ARC and nanoscale flow cytometry, uh, followed by Dimitri Aubert, CEO of a new company called Vesiculab, who uh, that produces uh, materials for all parts of the EV research workflow. And he will present extracellular vesicle research workflow, improving each step from production to functional assay. Finally, we'll hear from Dr. Frauke Henius, uh, staff scientist at Thermo Fisher Scientific, who will present facing the challenges of extracellular vesicles enrichment and analysis. And I think we're gonna learn about some new, or at least they were new to me when I first heard about them, uh, tools for isolating EVs um, from complex mixtures from her presentation. Finally, we'll wrap up with uh, closing Q&A. So um, we encourage you to uh, submit your, your questions into the chat for the meeting at any time. Uh, and we'll discuss them all at the end uh, in an interactive format. So um, go ahead and put them in there as they come up. So if you've not heard of Spectrodyne, we develop a breakthrough instrumentation for analytical or accurate nanoparticle analysis, analytical technology. Uh, and our goal is really to reshape the discovery, development, and production of modern therapeutics. And that includes EVs, obviously, for their promise as biomarkers and therapeutics. Um, their applications are growing rapidly. Uh, we know about understanding their importance in fundamental biology and as their potential for uh, use as biomarkers and therapeutics. Importantly, EVs are nanoparticles, and at this size scale, the size and concentration of the particles very strongly dictate their performance or their behavior in a biological context. So if we think about it as a therapeutic, uh, the size and the concentration of the particles is really the dose of the material, right? So obviously that's an important metric, uh, important um, uh, quality attribute of the material. Uh, size also determines uh, diffusion very strongly, and so that is the bioavailability. Uh, and ultimately, these combine to yield the safety and efficacy of nanoparticle-based therapeutics. EVs obviously are produced in uh, very complex uh, samples, though. And so that means that the identification of specific particles in those like soups uh, is really important. So, uh, you know, they're made in biofluids and cell culture media, cell lysates. Uh, so it's important to uh, be able to identify these particles. So what we hear from EV researchers and others is that size, concentration, and phenotype are three essential critical quality attributes that are required for effective EV research. And I'd like to illustrate this with a canonical example uh, it kind of doesn't matter if you're working on EVs or uh, LNPs for this example to resonate, I think. Um, but the, in this scenario, you're a scientist and you're trying to understand the difference between two different formulations or preparations of EVs, A and B. Typically, the way this is done is the two formulations are prepared and applied to a test system. So in this case, I'm illustrating that with cell culture media or I mean cell culture system. And the formulations affect a response in the cells that are then measured with a cell analysis technique. So maybe flow cytometry, for example. I think there's probably no scientist on the call that would dream of doing this experiment without first normalizing for the dose that's applied to the test system, right? Formulations A and B, you can't put 10 times as much of B on there and expect to be doing good science and compare the outcomes properly, right? So. Accurate size and concentration of the specific particles of interest in the formulations A and B is a critical step or you know, measurement um, that needs to be performed for, enable, to enable good science. There are a lot of techniques for measuring the, uh, the output here, flow cytometry or microscopy for one on the cells, um, but there are not a lot of good techniques for measuring the input to this experiment. So, Typically, workflows are complex, requiring multiple instruments, right? And I'll point out that each of these techniques is a light-based technology uh, using scattering or imaging to detect the particles. 
And so they're not well suited for nanoparticle analysis. These are indirect measurements that are using light scattering to detect, to infer the size of the particles uh, from you know, indirect measurements. And to, to synthesize these different techniques is complex. Uh, frequently it leads to misleading results. So what we hear from the market from researchers like you is that there's still a critical need for direct and accurate measurements of EV size, concentration of phenotype. And that's where Spectrodyne comes in. So this is Spectrodyne's second product, the ARC particle analyzer. It delivers direct and accurate measurements of EV size, concentration, and fluorescence-based phenotype uh, starting at around 50 nanometers and up. Importantly, this technology requires no assumptions about your sample. So its accuracy is independent of refractive index, the sample's polydispersity, or the heterogeneity of the sample in terms of size or any of the other physical properties, refractive index, for example. Uh, finally, it's fast and easy to use. There's no alignment or calibration or cleaning required in order to operate this instrument regularly. The way it works is by combining two uh, different orthogonal methods in a single measurement. So, and the magic happens inside this microfluidic cartridge. What we do is the sample is flowed through a bottleneck in the, in the fluid channel. So the particles are uh, flowing through one particle at a time. And every time a particle goes through, we measure its size and their concentration electrically. So this is not a light scattering technique. It's complementary and fully orthogonal to light scattering methods. So uh, we measure the size and concentration electrically for every particle as it goes through. And now in the arc particle analyzer, we're also exciting each particle with an excitation laser uh, as it goes through simultaneously and measuring the fluorescent light that's emitted by the particle. And so uh, we can detect fluorescence in up to three optical channels for every particle that goes through. Inside this cartridge are a number of features that make it easy to use. So these are highly engineered devices. Uh, they include a uh, embedded input filter to prevent clogging of the constriction. They're nanofabricated, and so they are consistent features. There's nothing deformable or stretchable about these feature sizes, and that yields consistent results. Um, and we have precision control over the fluid flow inside the cartridge. Ultimately, for the user, that means that these are easy to use. The whole system is easy to use. You can analyze complex samples like cerebral spinal fluid directly on the instrument uh, or plasma or cell culture media. Um, the cartridges are consistent and pre-calibrated. Again, there's no calibration required. And because we're using microfluidics, only a few microliters of your sample are required for analysis. So the ARC is already delivering uh, new insights in each of our key application areas, so nanomedicine, LMP quantification, payload quantification, virus measurements, uh, very fast live viral or virus titer this way. Um, and of course, we're here to talk about EVs today where um, already the ARC is delivering new insights into the fundamental structure of EVs. And I would like to highlight a new publication uh, in Nano Letters from a couple of weeks ago. Uh, Lou or Inal is going to chat the link to uh, this paper, put it in the chat so you can find it easily. Uh, it's a really cool paper using orthogonal uh, techniques, including the ARC and a conventional flow cytometer to uh, measure the refractive index of EVs very, very carefully. So I encourage you to go and check out this paper. Uh, it's new and um, a really interesting use of two different methods. So. With that, uh, I will hand it over to Dr. Yo Johan Kim from Mayo Clinic, who will present a comparative analysis of fluorescent particle size and concentration using ARC and nanoscale flow cytometry. And I will share my screen or stop sharing my screen and um, hand it over to you, Dr. Kim. Thank you. Thank you, John Luck, uh, for a nice introduction and a kind of your invitation to this webinar. Um, so I'm Johan from um, Mayo Clinic, uh, Department of Urology. And uh, today I'm going to share our approach to uh, 
perform a comparative analysis of uh, measurement of fluorescent particle size distribution between uh, microfluidic or resistive per sensing, which is arc system versus uh, nanoscale photometry. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right. So I'm gonna just laser, put the laser point. Okay, good. Before I start, I wanna just uh, put my acknowledgement. I really thank all the collaborators and uh, um, colleagues, especially Spectadyne, um, your collaboration was very valuable to perform this uh, orthogonal validation, especially uh, Nav, who performed all the experiments with our reagent and uh, EV uh, samples so that we could do some uh, very uh, precise of uh, um, the study between the Spectadyne and our lab. First, I want to highlight uh, the value of extracellular basketball from uh, different biomarkers and especially for a uh, disease. And I also wanna highlight why we need to pursue uh, rigor and re reproducibility in the especially EB uh, biomedical research. So as I said, extracellular basketball hold a great potential as non-invasive biomarkers for different disease. And uh, I'm from um, the cancer research laboratory and we found uh, the extracellular vesicles from a patient plasma or urine holds great potential as a uh, biomark, uh, non-invasive biomarker. So I'm going to introduce briefly uh, what we found uh, previously. So uh, we collected um, different patient who uh, underwent those uh, radiation therapy for their metastatic prostate cancer disease. And then from their plasma, we detected two uh, protein positive, surface antigen positive extracellular vesicles. So first, PSMA and STEP1, those are known as a process specific uh, protein, but enriched in um, prostate cancer compared to normal prostate tissue. And uh, by using our uh, nanoscale flow cytometry from Apogee A60 uh, MicroPlus system, we could detect PSMA and steep one positive extracellular vesicles. And uh, by doing a retrospective study, we compare with this uh, EV data with the clinical feature, and we found out uh, those patients who had a high PSMA and uh, steep one EV levels before their treatment actually had a lower chance to survive longer compared to those patients who uh, exhibited lower levels of PSM and steep one. So um, I think that there's key uh, requirements trans uh, to translate the uh, discovery from the bench side to the clinic side. We require something traceable and a reproducible EV measurement. What that means, um, different groups, different instruments have different, um, for example, different lower limit of detection of in size and the fluorescence of the, the particles, but also different groups uh, and the different uh, instruments requires different analytical conditions such as types of a buffer and um, the, the instrument setting and so on. So to translate the discovery and to compare these uh, finding between different groups, we definitely need the calibration of the instrument and uh, how to standardization in the data report to ensure reproducibility and uh, comparability. Okay, fortunately, now we can uh, provide ARC, the microfluid resistive per sensing with the fluorescent detection which is state of art, can provide a precise biological um, particle detection and size distribution measurement from biofluid. So as John Luke introduced briefly, um, the R can detect a single, a single particle passing through the nano uh, constrictor and simultaneously, we can also detect the fluorescent signal that um, uh, shown as a voltage disruption 
showing the size of the uh, voltage disruption as a peak and then translated to size and the duration is equivalent to the concentration. And same time, laser can uh, hit the particle and uh, detect the fluorescent signal. And the arc provides the two steps of um, uh, data acquisition. So first, uh, measure the particles size and the distribution, and also discriminate those particles from those background noise. And by using gating system, we can discriminate those true particles from the noise. And secondly, the R can export to those fluorochrome conjugate antibody labeled uh, recombinant EVs from uh, those background or non-stained the recombinant EVs. So that the data we're showing is from our sample and trying to explain how we uh, perform all the comparison. So with that um, very uh, state-of-art technology, we, uh, we have to validate whether this uh, arc can provide us a precise size measurement and uh, detection of those uh, fluorescent positive uh, extracellular vesicles from different uh, um, samples. And we have the previous uh, effort to sh show our uh, MRPS. Uh, we can perform something reproducible, uh, particle size distribution measurement of EVs from biofluid. And also, Arvid et al. and Bagar et al. showed that MRPS could be utilized to measure uh, particle size distribution of synthetic bees, uh, cell culture derived and um, biofluids such as plasma derived EVs compared to uh, other orthogonal methods such as nanoscale photometry and NTA. And also as uh, John Luke highlighted the paper from uh, Michelle Pleed and uh, Joshua Welsh, they actually developed it, the method of deriving core refractive index of biological particles using the nanoscale photometry and the MRPS and ARC. So besides these efforts to make um, the ARC um, as a validated method, we, here we also aim to closely evaluate the comp compatibility of ARC and the nanoscale photometry for orthogonal validation of the particle size and the concentration measurement for uh, fluorescent biological EVs. Firstly, I'm going to just briefly uh, introduce our Apogee A60 Micro uh, Plus system for who uh, don't know. So nanoscale photometry, same as regular photometry, um, we use a hydrodynamic particle detection, which means that the sample comes with a sheath fluid to the flow cell, where, which is the heart of the flow stometry. And using uh, light scaring and uh, light scaring and the fluorescent um, detection, we can measure the size and the fluorescent intensity of particles. However, um, the nanoscale flow stometry doesn't provide those absolute size um, estimation and the uh, the fluorescent uh, intensity measurement. So we had to do the calibration of the light scaring and the fluorescence detection with the calibration bit. And we went through the transformation of data, those data from arbitrary unit to absolute unit, such as nanometer and the MESF. And this is the experimental protocol how, uh, that describes how we did. And this is from our SOP. Uh, we usually have those uh, EV sample. For, for instance, here, we had a stock recombinant EV sample from um, cell culture that the human process can sell the exogenously express the protein A. And we had those uh, stock fluorochrome conjugated antibody to detect those antigen on EVs. Then we perform the EV sample dilution and antibody uh, dilution in first PBS with a poloxomer and second PBS. The first PBS poloxomer for the analysis with ARC and the PBS only for the Apogee A60 micro plus system. Then once um, two, 
two uh, EV samples and antibody were uh, co-incubated co at room temperature for 30 minutes and we did data acquisition. So first part that we are going to show uh, how ARC performs in terms of, of, of fluorescent um, EV detection and concentration measurement. And it's very exciting uh, technology that can uh, afford the multi-size, uh, the, the particle measurement size measurement in the uh, wide, wide size range. So as you can see, uh, the arc with the MRPS first uh, measured the size of the particles from a 65 nanometer to 400 nanometer with a C400 cartridge, and uh, we could also measure the size of the particles from 130 nanometer to 900 nanometer with the C900 cartridge. By using these two cartridges, we could uh, measure the size of the particles and the concentration. And as you can see, those two plus are very um, closely stitched and then that resulted in a continuous plot. So that uh, allows to uh, measure those particle size in a wide range. Then after that, uh, we performed the fluorescent uh, detection by using these two different cartridges. And as you can see, uh, among those uh, particle detection, we could see that um, the, the recombinant EVs that were uh, positive to um, the fluorochrome um, conjugated antibody in these two uh, scatter plot. And from this data, we could also plot this, um, the, the particle uh, plotting using two different cartridges. And as you can see, uh, usage of multi, uh, multiple cartridges can be overlaid here, and which can result in the measurement of fluorescent and about positive recombinant EV in a wide uh, side range. So once we uh, confirm that the ARC provides really good um, fluorescent recombinant EV detection in uh, the wide size range, now we uh, move on to the evaluation of compatibility of fluorescent PSD measurement with um, EBFCM and MRPS. Before our uh, previous slide showed that uh, the, the light scaring derived the lower uh, limit of detection for flow stomatry is 188 nanometer. And also with the EV flow stomatry, we usually uh, detected more than 90% of particles in size range of under uh, one micron. So we here, before I jump on to the result, I just wanna uh, put a note that we only had uh, the size of, the particle size detection between 190 nanometer to 900 nanometer for our comparison between two technologies. And as you can see at the first look, uh, the left panel is the, the scatter plot from the the Apple G860 that uh, detected um, 488 conjugate, Alexa Ford 488 conjugated antibody uh, detected those uh, recombinant EVs uh, compared to the, those uh, non-labeled uh, non EVs or background. And ARC also could detect those antibody positive uh, recombinant EVs. And as you can see, we, definitely, we can see there are some differences in the lower limit of detection for the fluorescent uh, detection. For EBFCM, we had approximately 180 uh, MESF. Compared to that, MRPS could show that the lower, um, lower detection of uh, limit as a 110 MESF. And as a result, uh, ARC could detect a more uh, the wide range of fluorescence. So uh, it resulted in the lower M, uh, mean, fluorescent, mean fluorescent intensity of those fluorescent EVs. However, we want to have something um, more transparent and a more rigorous uh, comparison. So we set uh, the LOD to compare those quantification of the, those uh, antibody positive EVs. 
So we set the lower limit of detection as a 180 uh, MESF. And as you can see, as LOD of the MRPS raised, we uh, experienced some loose of those uh, fluorescent antibody positive EBs. So as a result, we could uh, quantify those antibody positive fluorescent uh, EBs in those scenarios. When we had those uh, instrument specific LODs, we could observe that the ARC uh, detected more uh, antibody positive uh, extracellular vascular compared to EBFCN. But as we uh, raise the LOD to the, the same as um, EBFCN, then the uh, ARC actually, that the resulted in ARC losing the, some of the, the antibody positive EB concentration. So from this each scenario, we can definitely see uh, ARC provide a more uh, much lower uh, LOD in the fluorescent detection that um, can show us or can provide a more sensitive uh, detection of fluorescent EBs. And this result also, also emphasize that, so the color calibration of EBFCM and the standardization of the, the, the result is essential for this type of orthogonal validation. And also, we used the, those uh, recombinant EV sample from um, crude uh, cell culture medium after um, concentrating that. So that might also suggest us uh, purification of biological EVs from crude sample might allow us uh, to perform more reproducible uh, PSD measurement of fluorescent EVs. And this is only part of uh, our um, the current manuscript uh, preparation. So please stay tuned with um, with us. Uh, more detailed um, the study result will be shown in the later uh, publication. Other than that, I want to kind of highlight um, the current our perspective in terms of ARC and uh, its performance. And uh, from our opinion, ARC can perform sensitive fluorescent EV detection with a wide size range. And also we think that R can provide the measurement of fluorescent particle distribution in a pre-calibrated and a standardized manner with absolute unit with a nanometer and MSF. And as John Luke also mentioned that R can remove background signals as a filter tray between the sample port and the nanoconstrictor in the microfluidic uh, cartridge that can result uh, in the lower fluorescent um, uh, limit of detection uh, followed by the more sensitive fluorescent uh, EV detection. To uh, summarize everything, we think R can be utilized as one of the orthogonal methods for other single vesicle analytical tools such as uh, nanoscale photometry so that we can afford more precise particle size determination and the measurement of the concentration of fluorescent biological EVs with high reproducibility. Thank you. Thank you for listening and uh, happy to answer uh, any questions later. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kim, for the great presentation. I think that uh, one, one thing I really appreciated was the attention to the limits of detection, which is a really important part of any kind of standard uh, standardization comparison between measurement techniques. Uh, that's great. So thanks for highlighting that. Thank All right. Uh, we will uh, switch gears now and uh, introduce Dimitri Aubert, CEO of Vesiculab, who will uh, tell us about some new products that Vesiculab is bringing to market for the EV analysis workflow. Thank you. Go ahead, Dimitri. Thank you very much for the introduction, Jean-Luc. And uh, good uh, morning or afternoon, uh, everyone, depending on where you are in the world. So uh, for for you, do not, for those who don't don't know me, I'm um, Dimitri Aubert, and um, CEO of uh, at Vesiculab here in the UK. Uh, I've been um, involved in the field of um, extracellular vesicles and um, nanomedicine for um, over 12 years now, 
and um, today I'm going to um, to present um, solutions that are uh, going to improve um, the, the EV workflow from the production to uh, the functional assay. So a quick um, um, a quick overview of um, of Vesicula. Um It's based um, just north you of. Um, can see your slides, yeah. You can see the slides. Oh. Oh, okay. Let me try again to share. Ah, sorry about that. No problem. Better. Great. Wonderful. I didn't want you to miss the very nice pictures. Oops, the very nice pictures. So this is uh, this is uh, where we're based, north of uh, Nottingham, and uh, the, uh, the the clock tower building, uh, historic building of the the small Beswood uh, village. And uh, so the operation started in uh, in June, uh, focusing again on on extracellular physical. So um, I'm, I'm very glad that. Uh, to look invited uh, for uh, discussing that uh, that particular aspect of uh, our operations. Um, we're focusing on the um, uh, the reagent and, and consumable uh, type of solutions. Those really two um, um, to uh, to focus on on non cementation at the moment, uh, being an add on to them, and uh, we active worldwide. As you can see, and uh, we've already been very busy uh, with uh, with users on the on, on four continents and uh, waiting for the uh, OC to decide. So soon on on five continents, helping um, uh, people uh, doing better science. The uh, the objectives the objectives and, and philosophies they really derived again from 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 my experience on the supplier side. For the for the past 12 years is really to to try to to bring efficient and, and reliable solutions to to EV research. Um, a great deal of progress have, has been um, achieved uh, over that over that time, but I still hear the stories of of struggle um, getting the basics done. Sometimes um, maybe even more so in an academic settings. How do I get my EVs? How do you? How do I uh, store them? How do I uh, analyze them? How do I do a, a functional assay? So all these things, uh, they, they they're still not uh, trivial and lead to um, a lot of uh, wasted time. So um, that that's really reducing time to result is really something I like to contribute to, and um, as well as making the most of um, of existing assets. So there's always a desire to have better tools. Uh, as we discussed uh, earlier, um, uh, but also to um, uh, to do some assays better on existing uh, instruments while waiting for the the, the the new kit to come. And um, the, the 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 willingness is really to improve um, all the all the workflow really from production to to functional assay. And uh, my motto: by scientists for scientists. So really something helpful, not just a me too solution. So the 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 first the first, um, the, the, the first uh, product that has been uh, released is uh, as a reference uh, material based on, on an actual EV um, um, uh, isolate, which is uh, purified by uh, TFF and um, and size exclusion chromatography. It's um, it's um, over expresses uh, CD63 uh, with the fuse uh, fusion protein uh, EGFP. To make it fluorescent, in uh, for for detection on on, on obviously techniques that allows uh, this, and that's uh, uh, flow cytometry, uh, fluorescent NTA, and as we'll see uh, a, a bit later, uh, fluorescent MRPS as well. So these uh, these EVs are, are are very standard in the way that they they will provide a reference for um, a, a proper orthogonal um, characterization of EVs by um, many different methods. So we have a, a cryo TEM, um, for instance, NTA could be Western blot. Um, it, it can be um, obviously non, uh, non fluorescent uh, for, uh, for example, MRPS, if there's no fluorescence available. 
So that that's really part. It's really at the at the center of the orthogonal uh, characterization uh, regime. That is uh, um, the, the the best way to, uh, to to control for the the the, the characteristics of, of a material before going towards a, a functional assay. Uh, so early, uh, that, that's that I'm sharing here work that uh, that has been done on, uh, on on the Arc platform. So very very nice work where the the, the GFP uh, has been um, has been detected on uh, on uh, the, uh, the the busy ref particles, and obviously um, the the detection of the particle itself is done by the resistive pulse sensing in, initially so we have all all particles that have been that have been measured obviously uh, only a fraction of them are, are going to be uh, gfp positive so that's uh, that's roughly 40 uh, 45 percent and um, antibodies that are specific for um, cd63 uh, have been used to, um, to to label the material as well and these are uh, p positive and it's been able to um, to do uh, a, a dual uh, so dual label reading uh, the, the the two labels at the same time just to uh, uh, to affirm the, the presence of the of the cd63 so you see that opens um, different uh, laboring re uh, regimes and, and control of the efficiency of, uh, of specific um, antibodies. We also um, have uh, launched a, a, a dye which is um, specific to, um, to the lipid bilayer in, uh, ex in the membrane of extracellular vesicles. That um, that is going to provide a way to to basically make these EVs totally um, um, detectable by by fluorescence, and um, and the goal here is really to uh, to help the techniques that are, are struggling to uh, um, to to measure only on the on the on the scatter to to basically have the trigger. So we're talking um, mostly um, uh, fluorescence, but. Uh, there, there would be other applications as well. So flow cytometry is uh, is um, is struggling to um, to to measure um, just based on uh, on antibody labeling. The signal is not strong enough. So by using a dye that is going to stay in the membrane, it, you're able to 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 get a stronger signal as as a trigger and then uh, a screen for uh, for antibodies, for example. It is a water soluble um, dye, so it doesn't form my cells and, 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 and aggregate. And it's also very, um, very stable. So uh, it means that it's not going to lose its intensity. And it's mostly because it, it intercalates inside the, the bilayer that makes the, the membrane of EVs. And that means that after 24 hours, the the, the first and intensity is, is the same, and after seven days, it's it has gone down by only 10 percent. So it makes it very very um, efficient for functional assays, so cell uptake studies, and even in in vivo, it will be a, a good um, alternative to the the standard lipid dyes that have been used so far. And to, to to stay on this problematic of um, um, obviously having uh, having good staining, it's it's important to think that um, to to bear in mind that every time uh, an antibody or, or dye is used, there's 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 always an excess that is going to anger and suspension, and and even if they are not um, micelles or um, aggregates, they, they're still going to be. An impediment to a, a good analytics or functional assay. So um, we, we developed a, a spin colon with a, a gel that is very efficient at removing the, well, basically at keeping the dye on the on the top of it. So by size exclusion, the very small molecules are going to be stuck on the colon when the the EVs are eluting totally without any significant loss of, of material and no um, no large dilution. So that's really the big difference between these columns that are made for a very small volume, 50 to 150 microliters. 
they're ready to clean to clean up the EVs after the um, the incubation with a dye or with antibody. So you don't have to 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 worry that the excess uh, uh, reagent is going to uh, um, to be an impediment to the detection. For example, if it's fluorescence raising the background. Uh, or if it's uh, for functional assay, an excess, uh, um, an, an excess of reagent can itself react with the cells and, and lead to false, uh, false results. And because it's a, it's a two milliliter collection tube format, it's very easy to scale up if, uh, if the studies are, are based on, on, on very small amount of samples, but for a large cohort of, of patient samples, for instance, then it's very easy to, to scale up using, uh, using a, a swing bucket um, centrifuge and um, literally um, going for hundreds of samples at a time. So we, these are, the, these are the, 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 the first product of the company and there are more that are going to, to be released over the, the period of time. And, um, even before Christmas, a couple of uh, very interesting products are, are, are due to uh, schedule to, to release. So stay tuned and um, I'll be looking forward to answer your questions uh, after the, the last talk. Thank you, merci. Thank you, Dimitri. That's great, it's very exciting. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, let me share my transition slide again here. All right, so uh, we would like to now introduce Dr. Frauke Hinyas, a staff scientist at Thermo Fisher, who will uh, present Facing the Challenges of Extracellular Vesicles Enrichment and Analysis. And um, take it away, uh, Dr. Hinyas, thank you. Thank you. Okay, we see your slides coming and we can hear your voice. Great. Um, yeah, thank you, uh, Johnny, for the introduction and the invitation to uh, present in the webinar. Um, my name is Falka Henius and I work as an R&D scientist in Thermo Fisher Scientific in Norway. And today I will talk about the enrichment and analysis of extracellular vesicles. So there are several technologies for in V enrichment, like ultracentrifugation, precipitation, and uh, size occlusion chromatography. And all these methods have their advantages and drawbacks uh, with regards to yield, throughput, the sample volume, um, the EV integrity, and also protein contaminations, etc. And today I will focus on bead-based isolation of EVs. And this is a charge-based enrichment method. So to give a small background on the magnetic beads, we have two different bead platforms, the Dyna beads and the Dyna green, uh, with beads in different sizes for all kinds of applications. They span from cell isolation, immunoassays, to exosome isolation and detection. And one big advantage of magnetic beads in general for any kind of workflow is that they allow easily for automation. And one way of automating the workflow is using the Kingfisher technology. And Kingfisher instruments are magnetic particle processors. That means that in contrast to the manual workflows, or traditional liquid handlers, not the liquid is moved, but the magnetic beads are collected and moved uh, with magnetic rocks from one plate to the next plate, and thereby the carryover of impurities and contaminants is reduced because those are left behind in the liquid. In addition, um, it allows for parallel processing of 24 or up to 96 samples based on the volume. So the bead-based enrichment of the exosome is based on the physical properties of exosomes. 
and those are negatively charged. So due to the charge, they do bind to the positive charged beads. The process is reversible by ion exchange. That means that for further downstream analysis, the vesicles can be released again from the beads um, by using uh, high salt buffers. And since the enriched vesicles are bead free, this method is compatible with numerous downstream applications. Um, another advantage of the magnetic beads is the rapid binding kinetics. So it only takes 15 to 20 minutes to capture the exosomes from the sample. And uh, also the release is very fast. In addition, those workflows are automated on the Kingfisher instruments and they don't require any further instrumentation. As I mentioned, those um, beads are um, uh, they can be used with a lot of different downstream applications. And here are a few examples like transmission electron microscopy, particle analysis for size and concentration using spectrodyne, flow cytometry, Western blot, or mass spectrometry. And uh, one quick comment to the name of the bead it's called Intag Virus Enrichment. And this bead was initially developed for SARS CoV 2 isolation, but since exosomes and viruses share many similarities, like for example, the negative charge, those beads work very well for um, exosome enrichment. So on the following slides, I will look a bit deeper into the particle analysis and flow and Western blot results. So as mentioned before, the particle analysis was performed using the spectroline instruments. And in this example, uh, exosomes from SW480 cells were enriched using the iron exchange magnetic beads. And the released exosomes were then analyzed for size and concentration using two different chips, the C400 and the C2000. And the results were then combined into uh, one analysis. And as you can see, most of the particles are in the range below 100 nanometers. And this reflects the expected size of exosomes, which is between 30 and 150 nanometer. The concentration of the input sample was estimated to be around 10 to the power of 10 particles per milliliter. And after analyzing the concentration and the size distribution of the particles, we further analyzed um, for phenotyping using the ARC instrument. In this example, the enriched exosomes were stained with anti-C81, which is a well-known uh, exosome surface marker shown in, uh, in blue, and the isotype control shown in green. And the results confirmed that the particles that were measured were CD81 positive. The red line shows the depleted fraction of the sample, and there are still exosomes observed in this depleted fraction. However, um, the size distribution is very similar to the isolated fraction. So the um, vesicles that are left in the in the depleted fraction, is, it's not due to uh, size dependency. As I mentioned before, the enrichment method using the iron exchange beads allow for many downstream applications, like also Western blot and flow cytometry. And for Western blot analysis, uh, this analysis can be performed with or without release. But for flow cytometry, the released exosomes are recaptured using a target specific bead with an antibody targeting um, surface markers of the exosomes like CD81. And the bound exosomes are then labeled with a secondary antibody, either targeting the same protein like CD81 or targeting a specific subpopulation, for example, CD4 or T-cell derived exosomes. 
The workflow described in the previous slide was used for the enrichment and detection of exosome spiked into urine. Um, and both Western blot analysis and flow analysis for CD9 and CD81 showed a highly efficient capture and release. So we see signals in the positive controls and in the exosomes enriched from spike urine in lane two and three, both um, for CD9 and CD81. And the flow analysis shows also a signal in the spike urine compared to the background signal from the unspiked. Both methods also showed concordant results, uh, revealing a higher signal for CT9 compared to CD81, which uh, reflects the expression level of these proteins on the exosomes. A similar experiment was performed in serum, where exosomes were spiked into different uh, concentrations of serum from 10 to 100%. The Western blot results here showed that the exosomes are only detected in the release fractions and not in the on the beads after the release, proving that the beads are efficiently released from the beads. Both methods also reveal a slight decrease in the positive uh, signal from 10% serum to 100% serum using the same amount of beads. This is because a higher concentration of serum contains more analytes that are also negatively bind that can bind to the beads, making them less available for exosome binding. However, this can be compensated for by using more beads. This brings me already to the end of my presentation and I hope I could show you that magnetic beads uh, can be used for reversible capture and release for the enrichment of exosomes from different sample types. And in addition, enriched exosomes can be detected using beads with targeted antibodies. These targeted beads can also be used for the isolation of specific subpopulations of vesicles based on their surface marker. However, those beads don't have a release mechanism, um, but they allow for downstream molecular analysis when, for example, the exosomes are directly lysed from the beads. So thank you, and I hand back to Jean-Luc. Thank you, Dr. Henyes. All right. Um, uh, come in. Great. All right, so uh, at this point in the presentation, we'll uh, have a good discussion. We have about 10 minutes left of uh, questions. Happy to answer any in the chat, and I will let um, uh, Inal and Lou uh, moderate the question session. Thank you very much, Jean-Luc. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we've received some questions via the Q&A box. You can type those in and we'll respond. Alternatively, you could raise your hand, and we have one person who's raised their hands. So what we'll do is we'll unmute you, and then you can ask your question in real time. Um, you know, that person may have inadvertently raised their hand. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you want to ask a question, um, you can uh, just uh, raise your hand electronically using the raise hand icon and we'll unmute you. There are a few Q&A questions that have come through. So let me read one of them. So this one is addressed to Dimitri. So for Dimitri, do the SEC micro columns also concentrate the sample or just for antibody cleanup? Yeah, this, this is just for cleanup, it doesn't, um... It doesn't concentrate. It's really uh, a size discussion chromatography, but because it's a it's a spin action, it doesn't um, dilute away the, the sample like um, gravity columns. So it is a very there's only a very small amount of dilution, but it doesn't concentrate. Okay, there is a question. I think I will address it to Lou and Jean Luc. Is it possible for using the arc to measure the size from 40 nanometers to 65 nanometers? 
Uh, it's a good question. Many people ask, and we are working on it. Uh, we've shown that we can go as small as 35 nanometers in the lab, but uh, we're not at the commercial deployment of that technology yet, uh, but we are working on it. Thanks for your question. Um, I saw one other one I'll just grab while I'm on here. Uh, can this measure gas-filled vesicles like microbubbles or nanobubbles? The answer is yes. The MRPS technique is agnostic to the particle material and we have customers using it to analyze nanobubbles um, that way. So yes, thanks for the questions. Thank you. Any further questions, ladies and gentlemen? There is one that just came through. Is there a list of compatible common fluorophores and any information on relative brightness of the arc? Again, for Lou as well as Jean-Luc to address. Sure, yeah. Hi, Gary. Nice to hear from you. Um, so the way the arc is set up is a single excitation wavelength and then um, any, uh, any up to three detection bands in the, in the optical region, longer wavelength than the excitation. And so we can work with you to choose an excitation wavelength that's appropriate for your use, as well as you can, you know, it's user configurable, the detection channels, just by dropping in a filter uh, into the instrument. So that's very easy. Um, we have ones that we have example measurements of. Um, our default configuration is for uh, excitation at 488 nanometers, and then detection in a FITC or a GFP channel, a PE, like a yellow one, and then a red channel, like per CP. Um, so, uh, but it's very flexible depending on the application. Um, and I'm happy to discuss specific um, uh, fluorochromes either way, you know, if you have some of interest with anyone, um, we'd be happy to talk about it and how it can be used on the ARC. Hopefully Thank that answers your question. Thank you, Jean-Luc. Um, let's see. There are no further questions that have come through in the Q&A box, ladies and gentlemen. This is your time to ask questions. Alternatively, you can engage in a discussion with the participants. I think uh, Johan has raised his hand. So, Johan, you want to unmute and go ahead and speak, please. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question for Dimitri. I'm very interested in the column to uh, remove that the floor column. So uh, I might miss the, the information maybe, but um, uh, could you specify uh, the potential initial volume of a sample that uh, can go through column and what would be like a final volume after column? And the second question is, um, it sounds like the same as SCC, but uh, can you also separate between EV fraction versus the soluble fraction, the protein fraction? Yeah, well, that's a very interesting question. So the, it, they are very uh, small volume columns or really sample cleanup. So we're mm -hmm. talking between 50 and 100 microliters, maybe 150 if it's um, it, there's not too much excess um, mm -hmm. reagent. And uh, it's based on size exclusion chromatography principle. So mm -hmm. um, the, the goal is not to, to collect fraction, but to really collect EV. So the... The, the, the product is going to be eluted into the void volume uh, okay. when the, the, the very small um, uh, impurities that are um, uh, proteins as well as the, um, the the reagents that have been used for the uh, the labeling are going to stay on the column. So that's that's really the principle, and um, obviously there will be there will be an extension of of the range of his of his columns to accommodate a larger volumes, but it's it's not going to be um, um, a system akin to um, um, actor systems or, uh, or or gravity manual columns where the fractions are collected, but arguably. There's not really a possibility to get very, very uh, pure, uh, a pure fraction. You really have to use a long column uh, on an actor system to achieve that, in, as far as I could see in the publications. Makes sense. Perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Dimitri. Any further questions, ladies and gentlemen? 
Okay, so we have one person who's raised their hand and we're going to unmute. So Dr. Zhang, please go ahead and speak. Hello? And, uh, yes, we can hear you, go ahead. Okay, uh, thank you for the presentation. I live in the last uh, summit. So I have a question. So is there any timeline to um, like uh, for the production of the size uh, range of cartridge from 35 to 65? Um, I I am asking less just because we are urgent uh, for the the smaller cartridges recently. So is there any answer for me? Thank you so much. It's a good question. Thanks. Um, so I would say uh, in the next six to twelve months, we should have some. Uh, progress on that from a commercial perspective. Uh, obviously, as an R&D project, you know, it's harder to predict the timeline, but um, that's our goal. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Any further questions, ladies and gentlemen? I think we're coming to the end here. So we'd like to um, say thank you to Jean-Luc for moderating, giving the opening introduction, as well as to our excellent speakers for uh, providing so much great discussion data, as well as uh, an important topic. And we'd like to continue this discussion. We look forward to the next webinar by Spectrodyne and uh, hope everybody has a great rest of the day. Thanks again. And it's goodbye from us here. At Select Bio and Spectrodyne. Thank you and bye bye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Thank you so much. Goodbye, everybody.